GM. Welcome to uh, my roundup, which we're going to try to get in under half an hour, but there's a lot of games, like 50 games or so today of the day two of the Meltwater Gold Money Champions Chess Thingy Tour. And um, this great tour with a lot of the top players in the world has, has been extremely interesting in day one. And there was five games played today, five rounds today, so they've got through 10 rounds of 15. So let's have a look at what the pairings were for round six. And we we'll bring up the results at the end of the day so you can see who's doing what. And uh, there was a nice battle going on between two of the veteran players, uh, Lev Aronian and Magnus Carlsen. And I think Lev started to play really well again, which is great to see. Um, I mean, Lev's always been a legend and he played this game fantastically well. So let's dive into this game from round six. So it started off, normally Magnus is the kind of player who plays something a little bit peculiar in the opening. But Magnus, after playing the Sicilian, it followed normal theory for a couple of moves, knight f3, uh, knight c6, which Magnus played in the World Championships against Fabiano Caruana. Bishop b5, this line, very popular. Now g6, this is Magnus's preferred line. And now knight c3. And this can't be a bad move because it develops a piece, but it's not one of the more common approaches. Bishop g7, and now just a very simple move, d3. So this, to me, even looks kind of beginnerish, what Aronian's doing. But after d6, we see his plan. And the next idea is like, wow, this is very interesting. He now plays the pawn sacrifice, e5. Very peculiar move, and, and something that wouldn't have occurred to me. And the point of this move is that after Magnus takes it, Aronian captures on c6, and he's done a lot of damage to black's pawns, causing two sets of double pawns. White has a very compact pawn structure, very nice to have a compact pawn structure, and he's banking on winning back the e5 pawn or the c5 pawn later on. So it's a very interesting idea. And I think Magnus was doing fine. They both maneuvered around for a little bit. I like Magnus's next move. This is a very nice move. Uh, can you see it? C4, trying to return one of the pawns to get rid of these weak pawns. And do remember, Magnus has two bishops as well. That's another advantage. But just rookie one, taken there. He didn't like in this case. Queen comes out to d6, defending that pawn. And now bishop g5, simple development. Pawn takes d3, pawn takes d3. Like I say, we're gonna go through the moves a little bit quicker now. And Magnus was a pawn up here. But he's still got some problems with his pawn. Maybe the c6 pawn. Knight f6, h3, forcing that bishop to do something. Always a good idea, someone moves the piece into your own half. Knight takes e4, now we have an exchange of queens. One of the problems Magnus has for having the pawn there is that it makes his bishop incredibly bad for a, a long time. And after the exchange of queens, again, even though black is a pawn up, this pawn is very weak. And if that pawn drops, white has a very easy way to get a passed pawn with two pawns versus one. And even though black has this extra pawn on the king's side, it's much harder to create a passed pawn with white setup. And this next maneuver, very nice. You've always got to think of the best place for your pieces. And this knight now maneuvers its way around slowly. And to be fair, um, Aronian went on to outplay Magnus in this position. He very patiently ganged up on this pawn. And now at the right time, he uses the b6 pawn, uh, c6 square, sorry, the, b, the b6 square and pressure against the c6 pawn. And we can see he just puts Magnus pieces on bad squares. The knight now comes back and there's a big problem here. And after, this is the main issue that Magnus has, this bishop. If anyone was guessing who was playing this game, you would have thought Magnus would have had the white pieces. And after bishop takes a5, it's now clear to see that Aronian's taken advantage. He's got his pawn back and this extra pawn is, is not good. So very nice game there from Aronian and, and very impressive how he took down Magnus. Now another player who's been um, really impressing me 
um, for quite some time now. He won the Gibraltar competition, one of the strongest opens in 2019, is Artemev of Russia. He's only 2704, but he's really, really, I think, much stronger than that. And here he beats Ho Yifang in round six, and it's a really thematic game. So I'd like to go through this whole game quickly. Now, Artemev, if you don't know what he looks like, there you go, that's maybe an old picture, but he's been nicknamed the Chuck Norris of chess. Can you see it? Can you see it there? Some similarity. I think his Russian teammates called him Chuck Norris. Some similarity. Um, I did analyse a game on commentary with him and he, he, he seemed like a, a fantastically nice person. So uh, certainly, certainly a good guy. Now, he starts off playing the Tromposki. And after e6, he doesn't take the center, but he plays just some normal developing moves that soon enters into what we call the Tori. And this position, if you play the London system, is very similar to that, except your bishop was on g5. And I'm starting to play this quite regularly as white. I used to play the London system a lot, but I kind of found that I prefer my bishop here. This pin is quite annoying. So there's a couple of move orders you can try to do to get this set up with the pyramid. Remember, you've got to have your bishop on the other side of your pyramid. If it was still back, let's say, on c1, it'd be a very bad piece. One of the sort of setups I play to get it, I go knight f3, and if e6, I put the bishop on g5, and then I try to set up like this. And it's quite a nice way of playing against the knight on this square. And both sides now castle, and Ho Yifang now goes about developing her last piece. And now a very thematic idea here, as in the London system. It was called the London system because it started to be played in uh, the year uh, 1922 in a tournament in London. But here, one of the main moves that White plays is this knight jump. And I've won many games from this precise position with this idea. The point being, the bishop is a very nice attacking piece here, and Black's bishop this is the problem, as in the London system, is a very bad piece because it's trapped by these pawns. So white is slightly better because of his pieces. And this knight starts an aggressive approach with the F pawn coming up to stabilize. And then you can even bring the rook around to try and probe against the H7 square. Combined with the bishop, you suddenly get all this attacking power. So it's a very simple plan. Ho Yi Fang now exchanged. Knight comes back. Now, Chuck, Chuck Norris just takes on e7, and we see this f4 move. And I've had this position so many times. Ho Yifang develops bishop b7, and now you could try the rook maneuver, but queen h5 is a very simple move, threatening checkmate, forcing black to play a move in front of her king, which kind of weakens those dark squares, and now the queen comes in here. I, I nearly won an identical game at the British Championships once against Ravi, uh, a, a young uh, English international master. And here, if black doesn't do anything, white can just either bring the knight around to g5, bring the rook around, even bring the pawn up. So most players play f6, because otherwise they're horribly passive. And now after the capture here, the knight often comes over, and our queen g5 is quite clever, just pinning that knight down. And some very sensible moves, the last piece comes into the game. You might be thinking black's doing fine here, but the problem is, this bishop is stronger than black's bishop, hence we're going to see what black does. But the main issue with this f6 break, you've got to look at weakened squares, is there's a big square on e5. Sometimes the knight will come in there. And as we're going to see, after an exchange of bishops there, white also has this central break e4. And I, I think black's done a lot of trouble already. Now f5, taking the initiative. Top players always grab the initiative when they can. And after the exchange on this square, we have b5. And now the black position is a little bit weakened here. This pawn a bit weak. The king is quite weak. It's only got one pawn protecting it. So white wants to keep the pieces on the board. And look how white's got the rooks ready for this. While black's rooks are separated, not really having much you know, coordination. So the queen centralizes. B, uh, and after queen e5, the rook tries to now come back. But now, very nice idea, threatening to win the queen. And after rook g3, queen f7, 
we've got to get all our pieces working and I like this maneuver knight b3 this is a great move it forces this pawn on and look how this knight now comes in all of the white pieces working very well black tries to exchange but again white keeps the queen on the board because the white king is safer and the queen and knight coordinate very well together rook f7 but now look at this coordination between all the remaining three white pieces is very impressive knight e7 a threat queen g5 getting out of a fork but now the pin happens and after king f8 can you see the winning move knight d6 if the rook moves you lose protection of the knight so the rook comes down and takes the knight and this was a very smooth game so this kind of system which is the tory this kind of setup is well worth remembering if you play the london system try to do it with your bishop on g5 the point being the bishop is quite nicely placed here you don't block in the f pawn because on f4 you block in the f pawn and your very simple plan is to go knight e5 and f4 very easy way to play so next we come up and we're just going to do fragments some from some of the other games now um a player who has and I'm, I'm going to look at it always from the side that wins because you know I like being a winner I haven't been used to being a winner with my recent blitz play but you know it's nice to see it occasionally from the side of the winner and um, again as we mentioned yesterday there's a lot of very talented Indian players in this tournament and this was a clash between one of the more experienced players Vidit and one of the new players to the competition uh, Gukesh who's youngest one of the youngest grandmasters in the world a clear talent for the future Gukesh very interestingly said he didn't use computers in any of his preparation until a couple of months ago so he got to grandmaster strength at a young age without computers something I think a lot of you could learn from as well don't rely on computers too much unless it's g-chess now here um black after taking here has some pressure against this pawn but the position is roughly even and i just played vidit in a blitz match and i got crushed absolutely crushed he, he was just a little bit sharper than me and why the hell did he not play moves like knight g3 against me what is this move i do not understand it queen takes g3 and he's blundered a whole piece and this is a rapid tournament they had more time in this tournament than they did when I played Vidit in the Blitz. It never happens to me. I'm, I know, I'm not going to moan too much, but what a blunder. And Gukesh went on to easily win this one, just dropping a piece for nothing. So it, show, it gives us all hope if we're blundering that the top players do do that. Okay, another player which is always very exciting is uh, Daniil Dubov. And he's kind of met his match in this game. Daniil Dubov, extremely exciting player, but one player who may even be more exciting than him, who I want to see a lot more of, is Salim of UAE. Really aggressive attacking player. Now they had this position with opposite side castling, and now Salim starts throwing Harry the H pawn up the board. This was a brilliant game from Salim, winning with black against Dubov. And you would have thought this kind of position Dubov thrives in, unbalanced. But Salim loves chaos as well. Now knight to e5 was played and I'm sure the move that white would like to play is f3, opening up and get rid of that pawn. But there's a very amazing line here which I just wanted to share with you and it shows you how you can use the power of Harry to break through your opponent's position, especially when they are fiend chateau. So something like pawn here, and now let's say white takes here, pawn here, and now let's say white takes here. Very complex, white just trying to capture everything. And there's a number of decent moves here, but I really like the move here. What would you play? Have a think about it. Well, first of all, pawn takes h2 would be a big typical mistake. Because after king h1, this pawn is very useful for white. This is a very uh, common defensive strategy, using your opponent's pawn to defend. It's even better than using your own pawn because your opponent can't take it. But he can take your own pawn and this pawn will just sit there and white with the bishop here has great protection and now he can start his attack against the king so that'd be a mistake but i really like the move rook takes h2 here and the point being if white now wins the piece black is actually completely winning after queen h5 what is the big threat here well 
let's say you play rook f3, looks kind of natural. There's a couple of ways to win here, but the big threat in the position, can you see it? Black to play and win, how quick are you? Rook takes g2 is good, but I like this rook h1 move. This is really nice. Combination of these three pieces, bishop takes queen h2, and then queen takes h1 checkmate. And uh, Daniil Dubov did not play this because he's obviously scared of those lines, but as the game developed, Salim kept his call very well. He pushed his h-pawn anyway, and he did gain a very nice position with the queen now coming to h5, which he went on to win. Great victory for Salim. Okay, now, um, uh, black to play and win in this game, and Wesley So is always in playing incredibly good chess. And, well, sorry, after white's move, white played knight to g4. It's black to play and win. Can you see the move? In endings, the theme of Zugzwang is very important. You've got to get into your opponent's mind if you want to get a better ch better chess player, become a better chess player. Think what they're going to play. What are their only moves? How can I stop their only moves? How can I cut down on their options? And bishop f4 here puts white in Zugzwang. The pawn can't move. If the king moves, we take the knight. And generally, king and pawn endings, with no pieces on the board, are always going to be won when you're a pawn up except in certain situations the knight can't go to h2 the only square it can go to is to e3 and here black would have just taken this with a very simple win with these pawns so a nice little zugzwang from wesley so another player who's having a tremendous tournament and i hope i pronounced his name slightly right is urjun igasi of india uh, another one of the Indian players, another major talent who's I've seen him on playing in Title Tuesday and chess.com, very tactically alert. And here he's playing Vidit. And in this position, Vidit's actually doing okay. Vidit had some bad games today, but as we're going to see, he's still doing all right. And this pawn on a2 is so strong. But after king h2, he now blunders again, a second blunder from Vidit. And, and he must be feeling a bit sick of himself. For some of these blunders i mean white has these pawns four versus two on the king side so if you can neutralize this most dangerous pawn which is one square away from queening white white can win this game but it should be dynamically equal because white's so tied down to the defense of this pawn you can't activate your pieces because that pawn will come but vidit now amazingly played queen b1 and this is a move which most players would play or want to play if it works but after rook takes b1 the, the most obvious move i think it only now dawns on vidit when he plays rook takes b1 maybe his idea now is to queen the pawn and he'll be a rook up but it only dawns him now that white has queen takes a2 and this is one of those kind of illusions which happens to all chess players even the best chess players at some point you kind of miss a move in this position, you assume the queen has to run away, but it can just take on a2. And the ending after this one is, is really just simply lost. Black's two pawns down to the good. Very easy to win. And the other option after rook takes is if you go pawn takes here. Well, after queen takes this square, let's say king f7, rook d8. Black is just getting checkmated here. Let's say this check, king g6, queen e8 check. And we've got rook h8 next move. So another blunder from Vidit there. And it does happen. Playing five games a day without any break against the top players in the world is stressful. You have to be so much on form. But again, Arjun having a great result. And now talking about Arjun, he won a very nice game against Ho Yifang. And this shows you that you've got to use your pawns to break down your opponent's position. And White has ganged up against the g7 pawn which Ho Yifang now needs to defend and when you can't do anything more of your pieces you've maximized their potential as pretty much white has done here you need to look at pawn breaks to break those defenses down and again it's the h pawn the h pawn now comes to h6 breaking down black's position maybe this should be taken but it's it's really miserable for either of these captures maybe rook takes with the other rook coming in but it's not nice because look how the bishop has opened up 
Knight b4 was played, and now white decides this knight is getting a little bit tricky, so let's get rid of my opponent's best piece. And after rook takes g7, this pawn is so strong. And the problem here is, if black ever tries to go into the ending, an outside pass pawn and an ending is often winning. And that pawn would be winning this ending, because the black king has to waste time coming and taking it, and the white king can come this way. I'm assuming. So let's have a look. Something like this could be one variation. And the outside pass pawn and a king and pawn ending is always something you should aim for. And the problem that black has is that when you come and take this pawn, you sidetrack your king and the white king can just run through, as we see there. And the last game I want to look at is actually a blunder, another blunder. So we'll point out a lot of blunders. And this is a game where Daniil Dubov played the birds opening. And he was playing against Anish Giri. He's playing tremendous chess so far. Uh, I didn't have a chance to look at his game against Magnus Carlsen. We're, we're, we'll try to cover that another day. But that was a really exciting draw the two players had. With Anish sacrificing his queen. He's certainly turning into one of the most aggressive players on the scene at the moment. But here, white is the exchange up. But I prefer black. Why? Well, black has two pawns, so it's equal material. But if you look at, again, this compact pawn structure, I keep mentioning this, these pawns all compact. These pawns all compact. They're called pawn islands. They look after themselves. White's pawns separated. White's pawns a little bit loose over there. And there's no weaknesses in black's position. And after knight d6, um, we see a niche activating this knight. Daniil plays h4, but this is one case where h4 doesn't work. The knight comes in, and now the blunder, queen e2. Why did this move lose? And again, I played, and I'm not bitter at all, I played Daniil in a blitz match. I managed one draw, but I I, I wish he'd have played a blunder like this at some point. Um, quite easy to see, but again, I understand the stress of, of them playing. Knight g3 wins the queen quite sensibly. So let's bring up the standings at the end of day two. And you can have a look there. And the important thing to remember, there's five more games to go tomorrow. It's gonna to be extremely exciting, this encounter, because the top eight players go through. The top eight players. And as you can see, the top eight players at the moment, Duda on five points there, is just about getting through. And you can see, the Indian player Arjan has done a great move. The lowest rated player is on five and a half. Brilliant work. Gukesh, great experience this tournament. Adiban struggling. And Vidit, well, he's still, you know, he's just thrown away some points today. And he must be feeling the sickest out of anyone with the way he's playing at the moment. He's not having a good tournament. Uh, Aronian playing fantastically well. And tomorrow is going to be a very exciting day. It's 15 rounds, the top half go through, and then it's a knockout. Again, I'll bring, bring you daily updates every single day, so you can just look at these updates and know what's going on. I'll bring you the highlights. Um, there's so many highlights, we can make it hours long, but I want to condense it. I know not everyone has a lot of time. And please remember, do like this video and subscribe to my channel. That'd be most appreciated. Cheers. Thank you very much. I'll be back tomorrow.